webinar is now broadcasting to all attendees. Right. All right, guys. Two o'clock. Let's see. I think I can actually see participants. Oh, my gosh. 35, 37, 44. We are jumping up big time here on participants. Uh, if you're on the line, thank you for joining us. We're going to start here in like 30 seconds or so. I'm watching my attendee list on this other screen, and it keeps ticking up. We're at uh, 90 people on the line with us now, 93, 95. Um, let's give those last couple of attendees uh, a second. Uh, and I'm going to scroll through the list and see if I recognize any names on here. That's always kind of fun to see if I have some friends on the line. Daniel Rodriguez, how's it going, buddy? Uh, who else do I recognize on this list? Man, we got a ton of people. This is great. John Passowitz, is that the John Passowitz? He's my best friend from high school, John Passowitz. <laughs> uh, who I else see do Joey Puderbaugh in? and uh, my buddy Jason with Monticello Homes in Springfield. Oh, Jason's on. Awesome. Good. We got some friends on here, Jake. All right, we're at, we're at uh, 110 uh, on with us so far. It's slowing down the hair. I keep ticking up, but let's get started, guys. It's one minute after. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us. We've got a six-hour webinar uh, scheduled for you here. Just kidding. This is an hour. Uh, we're talking about one of my favorite topics, high-performance HVAC systems. And, man, as you can see here, I've got some really, really good uh, and nerdy friends with me as well. Um, so let me do some quick introductions and then we'll jump into the topic. I'm not sure where they place on your screen, but right below me on my screen uh, is Chad Gillespie. Uh, if y'all don't know Chad, Chad is, uh, is one of the top dogs at Mitsubishi. And if you see on the screen there, it's actually listed as Mitsubishi Electric Train HVAC USA LLC. Uh, and Train and Mitsubishi, if you don't realize, have entered into a partnership mainly for distribution. They're two separate companies. Um, but one really cool thing that happened with this partnership is now your local train dealer can also get uh, anything in the Mitsubishi catalog. Uh, so if you're in a market that previously maybe didn't have a lot of Mitsubishi uh, dealers or equipment, uh, now you can also get Mitsubishi equipment from train uh, as well. So they've got a, a great marketing partnership for all the U.S., uh, and so, uh, Chad, thank you for joining us. Anything I missed Absolutely. on your title there? No, you're good. Absolutely. And, and Chad, you mainly deal with high performance builders. So this is your jam. Uh, I've known Chad for many years now. So, uh, if you guys need Chad after the webinar, feel free to reach out to him. Uh, next up on the webinar order, Jake Bruton, my, uh, my builder buddy from Columbia, Missouri. Uh, Jake also is shooting his build show uh, on buildshownetwork.com, a super, super uh, top-notch builder. I've learned a ton from Jake over the years reading his uh, GLC articles, and Jake and I have gotten to be friends the last, I don't know, two or three years now, and I, I call him on a regular basis with air sealing details and nerdy questions, uh, so I'm looking forward to uh, getting Jake's perspective. And then Eric uh, on the panel, I've probably known the longest of this crew. Uh, Eric works with um, Positive Energy, uh, an engineering firm here in Austin, Texas, uh, and the founder of that firm, Christoph Irwin, a uh, longtime friend, just terrific designers. And these guys did uh, recently the design for my personal house, Eric uh, and one of his colleagues. Uh, so Eric's got a unique perspective, uh, understanding very, very thoroughly the design and the equipment side of things. Uh, Jake and I are going to be talking a little bit more from the uh, builder's perspective. Uh, and Chad, also used to be a builder, uh, is going to kind of help us out from the manufacturer's perspective. So let's kick it off. I've got 204, and it looks like we've got 130 people on, so time to roll. Um, we're going to be talking today about high-performance HVAC, how to get it, what is it, what are people asking for, and how can you up your game on your HVAC systems in your house? And this is a topic that's interested me for a long time. Uh, I felt like in the last 15 years I've been in business, uh, one, of the, one of my personal goals and one of my business goals was always to build a little better house than the last house I built, knowing that I'm always working with architects. Houses are always different in terms of architecture. How could I build the infrastructure, the things that are behind the scenes a little bit better 
on this next house than on my last house. And HVAC is a huge part of that. Um, so guys, here's the first question that I'm gonna have all of us answer. Um, with that high performance perspective, how do we achieve comfort and wellness or health within a home? Kind of a broad question. Uh, Chad, I'll throw it out to you first since you're, you're directly below me in the Brady Bunch uh, sequence here. <laughs> well, I, this is a, a really interesting topic for us and one that our company is, is certainly has been invested in for a long time. Uh, when we look at HVAC, you know, we realize that, you know, the idea of having a huge ducted system in a new construction or existing house can be very problematic. And anyone in building science can understand that. Matt, you certainly understand that. And, and Eric and Jake certainly do as well from our discussions. And I think that is one of the key things we're seeing the most of today, especially in light of coronavirus, is that more people are understanding that their houses are very uncomfortable and also starting to realize that they probably are sensing that their house may not be the healthiest as well. Um, you know, some of my friends are sp spending time at home and, and realizing that they have headaches or they're not feeling as well as they were because they're spending all their time in their home. And, you know, this is something that we really have to pay attention to. So for, for our group, especially, but as Mitsubishi as a company, we really want to make sure we provide products and work with other manufacturers of air quality products to, to really offer the best uh, solution. So it's important to us. And, you know, that's why we have you guys on, you know, all together so we can really find it from the design side, the builder side, um, and our side to really, you know, get the best products to the market. Matt, you're muted. Also, do you want to stop sharing your screen? Uh, no, I want to keep my screen up. I'm actually okay. going to pull uh, some of Eric's plans on in a second for my house just to show you the level gotcha. of detail that they get to. But Eric, I'd love to hear your answer on this. How do you achieve comfort and wellness health within a home? Um, well, <laughs> I guess the I guess the answer to that is you, you try to um, you try to study and apply some building science, right? It can't just be the mechanicals. It can't just be the building envelope. It has to be the combination of the two um, working together. So, you know, as a as a mechanical designer and and looking at various houses, you always have to be interested in and what is what is the space that you're actually conditioning? What are the goals of the homeowner? Um, uh, are there particular sensitivities that the, that the homeowner should be, um, is concerned about? Um, you know, comfort is subjective. Health and wellness is not, may not evidence itself the same way to every person. Um, so um, I, I guess you just look at the, the envelope and mechanicals and you see uh, how the, the how the systems can be um, applied to achieve comfort and wellness um, set points make sure you're doing good milk mixing and filtration um, be probably the quickest answer that I could give to that Love it. So, yep. how about you Jake uh, basically what Eric said I just always talk about it as a, a form of control I want to have control over that indoor environment. The whole purpose of building a home is a, it's an, or a building is a, it's an environmental separator, which means whatever's happening outside is not affecting me inside. And I'm just looking for control. And that starts with envelope that starts with the proper control layers uh, or, or barriers. And then that goes all the way through uh, HVAC to what kind of, paint and flooring we use like we're looking for all the way through the house uh and uh i think that uh i think it's a steve basic quote that if we design for health and comfort we get energy efficiency and we get durability as well so we're, we're just looking for control yeah for sure um for me you know it's been an interesting topic my my wife is school board president at our small private christian school that we go to you know, there's only 200 students there. Uh, and as board president, she gets a lot of emails from people uh, about what the board should or shouldn't do this fall in terms of opening. And one of the things that, that uh, she asked me about recently was uh, a bunch of parents wanted to know about filtration, what the school's HVAC system was doing. And they were proposing that each classroom uh, gets a little uh, uh, kind of a uh, Mac pro looking tube. That's an air filter for the, for the uh, room. They were like 150 bucks for per classroom. And, uh, and 
you know, the, the point was a good one. Look, we want some good HEPA filtration for the room. But if you dig into the details and you realize, uh, you know, these things only move about 100 CFM uh, at high speed. And high speed, by the way, is uh, 60 decibels. Uh, you know, how much are we really doing with this uh, when it comes to really making the indoor air quality better uh, in a particular classroom with this small device? And so as we talk about HVAC, you know, we've got some, uh, we've got an opportunity here, um, both at home and in commercial settings to make a significant difference for occupants. And just like Jake said earlier, it's all about the envelope first, right? We need to actually control the environment before we can do anything about it. But once we control that environment and we're able to build these tight envelopes, um, then we can do a lot of things uh, with that indoor environment. And I always love what Stebrick, uh, Stebrick has a quote, uh, Joe Stebrick, uh, um, the solution to indoor pollution is not dilution. Meaning, you know, we can't bring garbage in and expect to filter it all out. But if we have a tight envelope and we've thought about how it's built, uh, there's a lot that can be done. Chad, Eric, Jake, let me have you kind of jump into that idea of um, what's critical about a good HVAC design when you're creating a very tight thermal envelope on the outside of the house. I'll get, we'll keep the same order, I guess. Um, yeah, go I, ahead, I Chad. This is one of the biggest things that we really try to work with, not only for our, our existing contractors, builders, but also designers. And, you know, so many of our HVAC contractors that do new construction, um, kind of look at it, you know, in, in the old mindset of, well, it's an average house, it'll get three tons. And, you know, when we start showing them some of these higher performing designs, and we're trying to get them integrated into this builder's, uh, you know, network team, uh, you know, they're like, there's no way that this house is a ton and a half. And, you know, so we have to, you know, I really have to train them and, and have them understand that it's a very different house uh, than it was, you know, three years ago, five years ago, 15, 20 years ago. And, you know, that's the thing, you know, having that starting on a baseline with a, a good integrated team is, is probably the first thing you can do. Uh, we could talk about load calculations and it probably will at some point today. But I think that really is understanding that your team knows what the purpose of the house is and the goal. It may be a passive house. It may be an energy efficient house. It may be an ultra healthy with HEPA filters everywhere. But I think the first is understanding the goal of the project. Um, and if it's really high performance or passive, that the, 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 part, the participants in the project have to understand that it's going to be a very different house than the one down the street. Yeah, for sure. How about you, Eric? What's critical yeah. about a good HVAC design when you're creating a tight thermal envelope? Well, I'd have to, I'd have to kind of echo a little bit of what Chad said and, um, it, there are no rules of thumb anymore. There's there's nothing that we used to be able to rely on that that holds true for high performance homes, right? Um, the uh, square foot or the tons per square foot metric is out. Will do nothing but to get you in trouble. Um, mm -hmm. The um, you know what I get concerned about mostly in low load homes is is mixing and and dehumidification. Um, making mm -hmm. sure that we're handling the 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 relative humidity levels and and dew points and in various areas of the of the house. That's something that um, you know we use a lot of Mitsubishi equipment in our designs. As you're familiar, um, we like a lot of their systems and have them run all, all the time to circulate air and and provide filtration. Um, because that's one of the big things that you can do to help improve the indoor air quality inside of the house. Yep. For sure. How about you, Jake? I think that uh, our biggest challenge so far is something that I think is probably the most important and it's finding a contractor that's willing to put the time in on the manual J willing to believe the engineer and, uh, willing to expand their knowledge base. The market that I build in, uh, when we started using mini splits, ducted or non-ducted, you know, high wall units, uh, we were the only people in the market using them. And mm -hmm. our installers were saying, well, you know, the, the supply house can get this. Do you think this will work? And it's like, uh, I, I don't know how to do a manual J myself. 
So I think we need to get somebody involved who does. And it yep. took time to figure these things out. And it took time for us to, uh, I mean, we still are going through it. I just got HVAC bids back and they were $15,000 different between the two bids on a 2,600 square foot house. <laughs> that is clear that even if one of those guys is right, that means the other one is not. Uh, yeah. as to what the what the house is going to take so it's believing the manual j and putting the time in and and understanding what the load is like in these houses is super important it's more important than it used to be i would say let's take a tangent for a second jay because i think what you're talking about there is a really common occurrence uh among builders homeowners out there a plan gets put out to bid and i'm curious to know how much info you had for that hb HVAC contractor when you got those two bids back that were uh, so far apart. But talk to me a little bit about what you've done, you know, maybe five, 10 years ago, what you do today and what you'd like to do in the future when it comes to bidding so that maybe there is more of an apples to apples uh, yeah. between contractors on the HVAC side. So five years ago, I would say our biggest issue was uh, while we were really dipping our toe into the energy efficient market, we still didn't have uh, fantastic plans from our architects. We still didn't mm -hmm. have all the information that we needed included. Uh, the set of plans that I put out for bid for the house that we're about to start, uh, we didn't have a mechanical design but we do have everything noted from uh, either the set of plans or the scope of work that I provided. So I don't call out a tonnage in the, in the scope of work, but I did note what type of unit we thought we were gonna work where and uh, what kind of uh, patterns we thought we could expect in the house and things like that. And so you combine that with they have the numbers on the windows and I'm standing there going, we'll be below one ACH 50. We've done it on the last five houses. It's not a big deal. These guys know how to do it. Mm -hmm. And I'm still getting stuff back from my mechanical contractor going, well, you know, you can't tell me that you're below one ACH 50 because you haven't done it yet. And I'm like, okay, but I also haven't built the house yet. <laughs> And you're believing me that I'm going to build the house and I have a track record of taking care of these things. You know, there's, Excellent. so those are the, those are the issues that we're still dealing with. I think uh, that, uh, you know, mechanical design from an engineering plan, like we're looking at on your screen is not within reach of every residence in the United States. I think that I'm going to be very fortunate in the next few years because our clients are starting to, uh, be able to justify using uh, a mechanical engineer and us having a full design. And I think that that's going to help. And I wish that the world didn't operate off of who can do it the, for the cheapest per square foot price rather than. Boy, that's for sure. You know, no doubt. Who can build the best house. And this is part of building the best house. Let me, let me piggyback on that. I know we're taking a slight tangent from where we talked about going, but uh, you know, Jake talked about, um, the way he's done it in the past and the way he's going. And what you're seeing on the screen here is actually not my final uh, plan, but my 50% set that Eric uh, and his team at Positive Energy worked on. And as you can see, I mean, this is just, in comparison to me just handing an architectural plan to an HVAC contractor and say, giving me a bid, or maybe like I did 10 years ago, an, a plan plus a spec sheet that said, I'm looking for a, two stage and I'm looking for metal trunk lines and I'm looking for, uh, you know, nicer grills. Give me a bid. Boom. When I hand this off, uh, you know, again, not everybody can afford this, but look what's on here. We've got grill and register. We've got all the HVAC equipment from the mechanicals, uh, lined up here. It's a little hard to read on my screen, but there's all my Mitsubishi equipment for my house. Um, uh, here's the indoor air quality components. Uh, there's the duck layout for the second floor. Uh, he knows my mechanical contractor knows exactly what to do. Uh, and we have something to actually get a real bid off of. Should I want to take this to multiple bidders? In my case, I have one HVAC contractor I've used for 15 years. He's my only contractor. Uh, I think I've cheated on him once cheated is kind of a bad word, but I've used another contractor <laughs> maybe once or twice in 15 years. 
and I've always gone back to him. He gives me a fair price. We, we, I know how he bids. I know generally where the price is going to be. So his price is usually really close to my estimate that I've given the customer at the beginning. And then the customer and Eric and I, or some version of that team gets together and talks about the system we're going to use. It's an incredible way to, to build a house. It's totally abnormal than what's normally happening out there uh, in America. But look at these plans. I mean, we've designed everything. We've left very little to chance. We've got wiring <laughs> diagrams. We know exactly what we're going to do when we start in, installing the HVAC system at my house pretty soon. Uh, it's an incredible system. This is probably an unfair question, but Eric, if, uh, if someone watching this webinar, we've got, uh, you know, 200 people on the webinar. Now, if someone's watching and goes, gosh, I probably don't have the budget, uh, for this, um, walk me through a couple steps of how to maybe eventually get to this, or what are some ways that you can at least, uh, have your mechanical contractor have better information to give you a better bid and move towards a higher performance HVAC system? Um, yeah, you know, so one of the, one of the first things that you can do is just simply ask the question for the, for the load calculation, right? I think a lot of, a lot of the industry change that we are looking for and that everybody on the panel is looking for is just start asking the questions. Um, and then, you know, if somebody says that they're doing a manual J, ask for it, read through it, see if they've used assemblies, see if it makes sense. I think a lot of it can be fairly intuitive if you look at it and they have an extraordinary amount of people in there. And there's also, you know, every now and then if you, if you build enough, if you go through enough projects, um, you'll kind of get, you, you, you may be surprised sometimes where you'll, you, where you'll have a manual J that, that, shows you that you have a, a smaller tonnage per square foot number. Um, houses do get surprising every now and then, but I think that, I think the most basic thing we can do is just start asking the question um, and looking for the paperwork, right? Um, so a lot of people will say they, they will do it, but then when you ask them for the paperwork, they won't be able to show it to you. Yeah. Hey, Great Matt, point. And yeah, go hey, ahead, I got Dad. a question. Yeah, just on the, all those lines, I guess for Eric and for and all three of you, when you we were just discussing like what to look out for, like what are some of the things that you guys have seen that if something was well designed that a contractor might have changed or that you've come across that have been common mistakes? You know, a lot of our builders are like, I'm not even sure what I'm looking for. You know, what are some of the things? Is it obviously, you know, improper use of flex duct work, um, too small of duct work or too long of duct work or um oversized systems i mean what are some of the things that you guys see that are causing the, the problems that a lot of builders are having when it comes to comfort efficiency um health that's a good question chad you know uh this is a uh, an hvac um webinar but i would say it starts with the envelope and if you don't have a good envelope and you don't have for instance ducks in the in the um conditioned envelope, you know, you've got ducts in a hot attic. Uh, you really, you really have other lower hanging fruit that you need to fix first, uh, and get those things right. Um, before you're going to start really talking about upping your HVAC game. Uh, and there's a bunch of ways you can do that, right. Without necessarily going to expense. I've seen production builders, uh, in other parts of the country, uh, do lowered, hallway ceilings and run all their ducts uh, after a sheet rocker put sheet rock on the hallway ceiling when a fur down and then duct all those below the insulation and the air ceiling line and into uh, rooms. I've seen Jake do that as at his own personal build uh, mm -hmm. where he, you know, Jake's doing very uh, reasonable building costs in a lot of his projects. Columbia, Missouri is not uh, Los Angeles pricing <laughs> or Austin, Texas for that matter. He's got to really be concerned about cost. So a lot of his jobs have pretty standard uh, attic insulation with tons of thick blown in the, in the sheet rock as your air ceiling line and then all the mechanicals below that. Uh, and that could be done ducted or ductless. Uh, ductless is another way to go. I remember uh, the very first time I ever saw a Mitsubishi system and a, and a ductless mini split. 
was visiting Japan uh, 16, 17 years ago as a younger builder. And I was blown away that this little 1500 square foot house that I stayed in in Japan only had three mini split heads. And one of them was in my bedroom. And how cool is it that I had this little controller on the wall I could pop out and go, I'd like it at 70 degrees in my bedroom. <laughs> Crazy. Perfect. And you know what? That system, I've installed that same system now a bunch. It's really easy. You put one unit outside, you have maybe three heads on the inside tied to one unit. There's no duct work. And oh, by the way, they're a lot less costly to install than a ducted system. And you get great uh, efficiency and you get great distribution uh, in the places that you need it most. But it all starts with a really good envelope that's well air sealed and has good thermal values on the outside. Um, I took a little bit of a tangent, but one thing I did want to ask you specifically, Eric, and maybe you, Chad, is, is there a way, and I, I know the answer already, but I'm curious to hear what you guys think or, or could articulate, is there a way to get manual J's um, from people besides your mechanical contractor? <laughs> <laughs> I can certainly say you know, there absolutely are. Um, you know, we, <laughs> we, we, we recommend a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of different professional design firms across the United States. And, you know, we use Energy Vanguard, you know, for a lot mm -hmm. of our Southeast. Um, I mean, he's done, Allison's done projects for us all over the United States, but we really, we, choose, we try to find good outfits that we know high performance homes, they understand our equipment specifically. Uh, that they can give good recommendation to contractors that say this is the proper load, but understand, yes, we are using a compact duct design. We're using a certain type of diffuser. And if you don't understand that, if you change any of that, then that will certainly mess up the system. But we definitely like to have design, professional designers involved uh, because we know that contractors are really strapped for time and margin, and they can't always dedicate the time they need or will want to for a proper load calculation. So sometimes we, we certainly try to get that designer involved to take a little pressure off of the HVAC contractor. Yeah. Yeah, I would, you, agree with, I would agree with that. I, I, I can't tell you how many times we've heard the comment from installers saying that they get paid to install, not to design. <laughs> and so that, uh, you mentioned Energy Vanguard. They, they do great manual J's. Of course, Positive Energy does that, but we like to do a full comprehensive design, not just the individual components of it. Um, so it's a little bit different service than what Allison um, offers over there. But yeah, there are, you know, we're, we're in a very interesting market, what Positive Energy does right now, um, that's gaining a lot of traction across the country. And a lot of people are starting to realize that um, homes, need to be, homes need to be treated a little bit differently. The uh, installers may be good with the equipment, but they aren't necessarily great with the ductwork. Um, a lot of the really good installers that I know personally, um, they know the, they know the machines and they can pick out the machines and do a pretty good job with that, but they just, they don't know duct work, um, which yeah. is unfortunate. Um, and that's, and that's a, that's a huge part. You know, anytime you start adding ducts to a system, you start adding inefficiencies mm -hmm. to the system because there's more pressure that you have to overcome. Um, and so you can have a, incredibly efficient air handler and completely screw it up with the ductwork. Yeah, you can, no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. Hey, let me back up a step. We, we kind of went down a rabbit hole, but I want to get back to your question. That's an important one. I think for this, uh, as we probably have some people on the line that don't have a lot of experience with higher performance HVAC systems. Um, heat pumps are becoming really popular in high performance homes, uh, whether that's Mitsubishi or any other brand for that matter. What do you think is a misconception about these systems that builders should be aware of? Chad, why don't you start with that? Yeah, I, I think the, the first thing would be price. They think that a high performance heat pump system is going to be dramatically more expensive than their traditional gas furnace AC units or single speed configuration. And, you know, it's really not. Um, you know, our, our systems are premium. I mean, we, we are definitely premium, but we also are very competitive. Um, you know, I mean, you can't really compare our 20 sear system to, you know, the, the bottom of the barrel 14 sear single speed. That, that, that would be, it's like, you know, that's not really a good comparison. But I think that's the first thing is that they think our products are more expensive um, and they're not. I think the second thing is, is that they're crazy hard to install. Um, that's also a pretty big misconception. That's more of a fear of 
some of the installers who have not had a lot of practice with it. Um, most of our contractors that we, we train and we train and train and train a ton for our guys, they, they certainly are, it's, it's as, as easy, if not easier than, you know, traditional systems. So I think it's definitely, um, expensive, hard to install. Um, and then probably the third is climate specific is more of cold climate. You know, they can't function properly in a cold climate and depending on how the house is built, oh, we certainly, certainly can. Um, and we have plenty of projects throughout the Chicago area and areas like Chicago that are heat pump only with Mitsubishi with no backup heat. So I think those are the three biggest things that are, in my opinion, that kind of hold builders up from even considering that um, uh, at, at first glance. How about you, Eric? Um, you, you've seen a lot of manufacturers. You've dealt with a lot of different systems. What are some misconceptions uh, about heat pump systems that builders should be aware of? I think the one of the oldest misconceptions is that they they blow cold air and old um, old heat pumps used to do that. Um, they used to supply temperature into your space. It was warm enough to heat the space, but was cold against your skin. Um, that's, and that's completely different now. And uh, the Mitsubishi heat pump that we had installed at our our office when 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 I used to work in an office. Um, we measured the supply air coming out of it, right? And it was close to 30 degrees outside, which is about as cold as Austin gets. And we were measuring 130 degree air coming out of the supply temperature, which is amazing and completely different than I think what people would expect at that, at that temperature. But I think that that's yep. probably one of the biggest things that I'd like to highlight and mention. I think that's pretty significant. Well, that's a good one. Jake, anything to add on those? They, they covered okay, quite a actually bit. You guys stole both of mine. Uh, the, the first one is they don't work in cold climates. Like, oh, well, we get down to, uh, you know, negative 10 for 10 days out of the year. And my go-to was always, uh, well, so does Japan. And Japan is a heat pump country as the entire country. Uh, and then I can't, I can't stand in front of it and get warmed up. You know? If we have, especially, and that one's come up multiple times with older clients who travel. So they've been around old heat pump units elsewhere in the world. And they've said, well, we turned on the heat to get warmed up and it wasn't hot. And those are two yeah. that we've fought when every time we bring it up, it feels like. Mm -hmm. And, and the, uh, you know, the, another point that I like to say on that one in particular, Jake is, you know, the older heat pumps would deliver air that was warmer than your space, right? So if you had your furnace or your heat pump, let's say set at 72, it was maybe delivering 85 or 90 degree air, but you put your hand up to that register and your 98 degree mm -hmm. skin temperature getting blown 90 degree air felt cold to you. Mm -hmm. But like Eric's saying now, and I used to say 115, 120, I didn't realize it was even as hot as 130. Oh, yeah. Now that heat pump's pumping out serious heat. So now your skin feels quite hot. You know, you've got a hairdryer on you. Yeah, I always uh, you have no it, idea. Yeah, I always refer to it as furnace quality heat, just to Ooh, people, put that in perspective quality. for people because they can relate to it. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Um, let's let's move on. Uh, just in the interest of time, I want to stop at about 20 till uh, seven or eight more minutes, guys. And by the way, if you uh, are not already, if you're listening and have a question, um, type your question on the Q&A section. I see a few people were using... Uh, the comments section, add it to the Q&A, even if you had it already. Um, we've got a couple of great questions. Patrick Van Dorn uh, has several on here. Uh, there's a bunch we're going we're gonna to answer here, and there's some really good ones. Um, so we'll get to those in just a second, y'all. But let's finish up a couple more questions. Um, I'm actually going to skip the next one to go to, go to one that I think is a real big deal. Humidity is a large factor in both comfort and wellness for a house. How do we get this under control specifically in a high performance home? Eric, you want to start on that or uh, Chad, you mind if I skip you real quick? Cause I want to go to Eric's answer. Yeah, yeah, on this yeah, yeah. yeah, definitely. I mean, the way, the way that we always do it is a dedicated dehumidifier, right? With a uh, low load homes, the whole, I mean, just in the saying itself, it's a low load it means the air conditioning is going to be running a lot less than it used to. Mm -hmm. uh, historically, yep we've all kind of been able to rely on an air conditioner running a lot and, and dehumidifying as a side effect of that cooling process. 
but really air conditioners are just meant to make the air temperature cool. They're not intended to actually dehumidify. Even the, um, the, the, the settings that are dry mode uh, wow. is one of them. And, and even some of the different um, manufacturers that have humidity control for their air conditioning units, they're simply overcooling temporarily um, to attempt to remove the humidity. Mm -hmm. And really the best way to do it is with a device that's intended specifically for removing humidity, like a dedicated whole house dehumidifier. Eric, get nerdy for us for a second and talk. help us to understand the difference between sensible and latent loads in a house when you do a design. Can you explain what sensible and latent means? Yeah, so um, in very general terms, sensible is, is what you feel. <clears throat> and then latent is humidity. It's the hidden heat. It's the, it's the vapor in the air that takes, um, that takes energy to it takes energy to condense the water out of the air and that's the latent heat it's hidden latent means hidden and so um there are two different types of heat um sensible what you feel which is um i don't know where i'm going with this <laughs> that's two, okay that's good the, the point that eric's making is that <laughs> There, when your air conditioner runs, it's both changing the thermostat temperature, right? This feeling of cold, what the, what the temperature says on your thermostat, and it's also removing moisture from the air. When, when that coil, that A coil in your uh, Mitsubishi or any other unit gets cold and it's 50 some degrees, let's say, the air moving through that hits this 50 degree surface, that's the dew point, and water starts collecting on that A-coil and dripping down the condensate drain. But until it actually drips down the drain, it's not actually dehumidifying. And the point is, what Eric's saying is the house like Jake builds and that sometimes I build, um, they are so uh, efficient, they have so little load that your air conditioner doesn't need to run that much, even in the summer. You know, if it's 80 degrees out and your thermostat set at 72, and Jake built the house with a, uh, you know, an air changes per hour of, uh, you know, 0. 0.6 or 0. 0.5 or some of the stupid low numbers I've seen him do a 0. 0.25 blower door when I was with one time. There's and super thick insulation. You don't need any Mitsubishi system to run for a long time when it's 80 degrees out with that kind of air tightness and that kind of insulation. And when it runs, it's just running a little bit. It doesn't need to run a ton. So as a result, you're breathing, you're cooking, you're showering, all these things are generating humidity. And sometimes we end up feeling warmer than really what the thermostat says we are. So for instance, in my house, mm -hmm. uh, I just have a standard system currently, I'm going to a Mitsubishi system, but I have a standard one stage uh, train unit that's t almost 20 years old. It was five years old when I remodeled, so I didn't pull it. And then I have a small dehumidifier. I keep my house, at night, it's 74 degrees and around 45 to 50% humidity with my dehumidistat, and I'm very comfortable. During the day, we let it get up to 76 or 77, and because my humidity is low, I feel great in that house. It doesn't feel bad at all. And I do have some auxiliary filtration uh, on that system that I wish I would have had when I built it, uh, and now I'm doing some of that on my new house uh, that's under construction. Um, but with that being said, y'all, we're like a minute or two away from uh, where we wanted to get um, for uh, Q&A. Let's switch to that because I'm seeing a bunch of Q&A come in and some of these questions are fantastic. Uh, guys, if you're just joining the call, all the Q&A is over on that separate Q&A panel. It may be at the top of your screen. Drop your question on there and um, uh, I, we'd love to answer as many of those as possible here in the next 20 minutes or so. So let's, let's jump on to uh, Patrick Van Dorns. In a dry or mixed climate, is there affordable ways to humidify the condition space as well? Call it a set it and forget it humidity setting on a thermostat for an unknowledgeable homeowner. I think what Patrick's saying is in a lot of climates, you might not want to add humidity sometimes. You might want to subtract humidity sometimes. Uh, Chad or Eric, do you guys know of a way to, uh, to do that? Uh, I'll start uh, as a manufacturer. We, we get this question a lot, and I know, um, you know, some of our friends from Ultra Air have gotten the same question before. 
can you make a magic box that dehumidifies and humidifies? And mm -hmm. um, really, there's not a, a really dedicated product on the market that does that. Um, you really, it, it's more dedicated to your climate. Um, and you have to, yep. in a lot of climates, you know, let's just take the, the Southeast, very humid. The primary thing to do is certainly dehumidify. And there's very few times that we have consumers that say, you know what, we just need it more humid in our house. Um, it, it's rare. And so that, you know, then you, you look at somewhere else, which is a very arid climate, and then you're going to do the opposite. And, and some of these things can be managed by coil temperature and airspeed. And certainly you can manage that um, a little better if you've got a you know good HVAC contractor and a good design. But it, it's really hard to have both unless you install both a humidifier and a dehumidifier. Um, yeah. There are some control strategies as well. Um, you know, we talked about a, a dedicated dehu, but sometimes we might run a system in uh, like what we call dry mode, and but we also add you know electric strip heat to reheat that. So it's not the best situation, but in a really oddball situation where someone might need extra dehumidification in an arid climate, we've seen contractors do that too. So th there are ways, but there's not a magic bullet right now that, that I'm aware of that does everything like a holistic press the button for the consumer and make it magic happen. And Chad, am I correct in understanding that like there are very few places in the United States at least where you're actually going to need both? Either you're in my market where a little bit of this, the winter, we want some humidity. Most of the summer, we want to get rid of the humidity. But in between, there's not much. And you go further north or south, your need for one or the other increases, but not both. Correct. Mm -hmm. Th that's generally what we see. And, you know, I cover, I have regionals that cover the country. And we rarely get into a situation where we need both. Now, again, if you get into a really oddball situation on a, a really high performance house, that's probably good where you're going to find it. On an average high performance or average build, it's very rare that you're going to want a consumer unless they have a specific reason they want their house very humid. Um, you know, we did have some, uh, some clients that were, um, you know, from, from the, I, I, I'm trying to remember where they were, but they were used to a very, very humid um, climate. So they ran their air conditioner, but they also boiled water on their stove to bring the humidity up to 65 to 70% inside the house. Um, that, was a, that was a problem that we had to go fix um, because, you know, again, we didn't realize why their energy bill was high. We didn't realize why they were having humidity issue or mold issues. And it, 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 was a, it was a really a product of the consumer. Uh, but yeah, from Jake, what you just asked, that's generally what we see. It's not, it's not both, it's one or the other. Um, my quick two cents on that is I heard Joe Stebrick talk about uh, magic box type products a few years ago, and it was an HVAC talk. Uh, and his point was, look, we're better off getting something that's really good at what it does rather than getting something that's supposedly good at everything. Uh, and in my experience, one of the things I love about Mitsubishi HVAC systems is they make multiple millions of them in a factory somewhere, whether that's in Japan or I don't know where they are, but they make 10 million of them. Some of the magic box type products or, uh, you know, not to bash other technologies, but heat pumps that are pulling heat out of the earth, let's say, what do they make? A few thousand of those? How much more reliable is this system that they make 5 million of them and they've been using them for decades than this system that they make 10,000 a year? And so for me to go to a really reliable system for my heating and my cooling, like a Mitsubishi heat pump, it just means that I put a system in and I forget it. We do some maintenance here and there and it goes for the next 25 years. And then separately I have a dehumidifier and separately I have a fresh air system for my houses. And now I've got three individual components made by really solid manufacturers that are really good at their thing and not all these things. And now if I have a system that goes down too, I have other systems that are still working. Uh, so that's my quick two cents on that. You have anything to add on that, Eric, on that point? Uh, you make a lot of really good points. You know, a lot of it is subjective, you know, heater um, humidity management, whether it's adding or taking away, it really depends on, on, the, on the occupant, right? On the owner. Um, when I moved, I moved from Georgia to Austin about six years ago almost seven years ago and i had even though austin is hot and humid 
I had nosebleeds because it was so much drier here than it was in Georgia. And I met somebody about the same time was, as I moved out here from El Paso and he was complaining about how humid it was. Mm -hmm. And so like, it's completely dependent on, on the owners uh, or uh, on who's living and where and what they're used to, what they've been acclimated to. Um, yeah. You know, the feedback that we get across the country is nobody likes humidifiers. Um, on, on a few projects in really dry, arid climates where we've talked to the owner about them, they've had experience with them and don't want anything to do with them anymore. Um, yeah, I can see so, that. Yeah, that's, so, so that's very interesting, but there are so many parts of our country that definitely need dehumidifiers. I, yeah, I will say, sure. Matt, there is, I mean, just that question, I, I won't take too long. There are thermostats out there that can manage humidity certainly, and they can engage a humidifier or dehumidifier. They can actually engage a dehumidifier. It's really that question was, is there a button you could press that's just magic and does it all? That's a little mm -hmm. trickier. Um, you know, we have an interface that, you know, we developed called Kumo Station. It's, it, it can handle all these things on one, one device that they all connect. But the problem is, is making sure that each is activated properly. And, and again, that's just that, that it can be done. It just isn't, it's not an average builder type of product uh generally they don't you know again especially someone who builds over 30 50 houses a year they can't really go to each consumer and, and completely define their needs and then develop a whole new hvac system specifically to their three days a year that they want it really humid so again yeah. it can't yeah. be done so i just want to answer this question it can't be done it's just it, it it would take a little more technology in dollars makes sense hey eric i'm going to put you on the spot i've gotten several questions on q a about costs for mechanical design uh -huh. um i know that's a really hard question i don't like being asked how much my house has cost either because it's a hard question as we're talking about everybody across the country but can you give any kind of guidelines for people like at a minimum to get a manual j done for you from an outside firm not even positive energy necessarily but an outside firm what would you might spend for that versus those plans that I had for my house up there? Can you give any kind of range or percentages from right. a broad perspective? So I, I think that you should be able to just get a straight manual J from a good, reliable company for somewhere around 25 cents to 50 cents a square foot. I think that that's the going rate. Um, I'm not sure. I haven't shopped it in a long time. I haven't asked in a while, but that's what I remember. Um, our mechanical designs are, depending on the complexity of the project, they typically start around a plus or minus $3 a square foot range. Good. That's really helpful, Eric. Thank you. Yeah. So I think then the next question is, uh, Patrick uh, Van Doren said, does providing detailed mechanical plans save money in the end because contractors can bid it tighter due to lower risk. Um, and actually, let me jump into this one because I find this yeah. particularly appealing. Yeah. Not necessarily. Uh, you're not necessarily doing those mechanical plans to save money or to really put the screws to three mechanical contractors. You're doing it because if you don't do it, you have no idea what you're getting until the homeowner lives in the house. And when they call you in six months to complain about comfort or issues they've got, you're talking about massive amounts of money and you're pain in the butt time to fix it. And that is the last thing you want, whether you're building $300,000 houses or $3 million houses, those comfort complaints are really, really hard to satisfy. So by having a smart team like Eric or others really think about it ahead of time and decide, Hey, how are we going to put the best equipment in this house? What equipment do we need? What ductwork do we need? How much airflow do we need into these rooms? Or even, I've heard Eric and his team say before, I know you want that westward, west facing wall of windows where the view is, but no amount of air there is gonna make that comfortable. <laughs> to have someone else say that besides me is super helpful. And oh, by the way, sign this piece of paper that says that when you're sitting in that chair uh, with that wall of glass in July and the sun setting, that I can't blow enough cold air on you for you to be comfortable. And you heard me say this and let's still do that. I'm fine with that, but you need to know <laughs> that I'm telling you ahead of time, that is not going to be the most comfortable room in your house at 5 PM on July while you're watching the sun go down. It's just mm -hmm. not going to happen. So having a really smart team on board 
again, whether it's an inexpensive house or an expensive house, means that later you're not cutting sheetrock, you're not changing equipment, you're not realizing, oh crap, my mechanical contractor put a six or eight inch duct into this space when I needed 300 CFM in this big room to cool it down and I can't get that no matter how much I crank up the fan speed for this space. Those are the things that you avoid. So ultimately for me, it's about comfort, it's about performance, it's about getting the best house, not necessarily saving the dollars. However, that being said, I think that going ductless, you can save some dollars and go watch Jake's videos about his house under construction. Jake built a super high performance house. I'm surprised it's not passive house rated actually. Crazy high performance and Jake's mechanicals are really low on the budget scale compared to a lot of houses I see. Fair assessment, Jake? Yeah. I, I And I would actually say that the uh, towards Patrick's question, we're probably not saving any money on the bid process and having them compete on a, but they might have a more even scale if they all have the same set of plans that they're working from. And it takes one more question mark out of the plans. So in theory, it might save money in the long run because I might save two production days because we're not having to have ductwork refabricated because a header was placed somewhere that the, the HVAC guy didn't know about on the plans. So the more information that I can have with the plans, the more I can have in scope of work or the engineering side, it's a potential to save a little. Yep. Yep. And production days cost a lot. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, from our perspective, it's the same reason why you wouldn't just go to a field and say, we're going to build a house with elements, right? You don't, you want to go in with a little bit of preparedness, know what your end goal is and know how you need to get from point A to point B and, and, and what you need to, to end up making it all work together. Like just a plan, having a plan makes a lot of sense. For sure. Yeah. Hey, let me ask this question. This is a great one from Tom Cross. Tom says, typical HVAC designs have two zones, one for the first floor and one, one for the second floor. What is the trend on number of zones in higher efficiency heat pump systems? It's like you teed us up for that, Tom. Chad, you wanna, <laughs> you wanna take this one? Um, this is one that you and I have talked about a bunch over the years. Was it, I'm sorry, was that to me? Yeah, it could be, or it could be any one of us, I but I thought this yet. might be. Well, well I, I, in a... Uh-oh, Chad went digital on me. Can you, are y'all hearing Chad? Not here in Chad right now. I, All right, I'll, Chad's out. I'll, I'll jump in. Take that, Eric. Jump I'll, in, Eric. I'll jump in. Yeah. So, um, yeah, definitely separate your floors, right? In high performance homes, um, um, Wisconsin may be a little bit differently because I'm pretty sure you have uh, some some different considerations. But typically, you know, heat gets trapped in the winter on the upper mm -hmm. level of the house in a high performance home. And often you'll want to have a different mode for the upstairs than you would want to have for the lower level. Certain times of years, it becomes important to do that. We've seen, we've seen in a lot of high performance home overheating during the winter in, in Austin. And so we like to separate that in zones, but also by outdoor units. So that you can run them in different zones at different times of the year. It seems kind of a counterintuitive to, to some degree, but um, it happens. Yep, it happens. Hey, Eric, uh, as a corollary to that, what if you had one system and you did uh, zone dampers? What do you think about zone dampers? And I'll, I'll ask Jake, Mr. Smiley, in a second on this one too. Chad, glad to see you back. We lost you yeah, for a minute. Sorry about that. We moved on. That's okay. Yep. Uh, Eric, answer the uh, zone damper question. What's your experience? It, it really depends on what type of system that you're talking about. But in any kind of conventional zone damper, I don't like. Um, um, Mitsubishi has just started offering this product by a company called AirZone that we've had some experience with. And frankly, I really like. Um, they, communicate, mm -hmm. they communicate directly with the VRF systems and there's no loss of fidelity with the, with the, with the refrigerant flow or the fan speed. Mm -hmm. And so they're a really innovative project, which is a product that is kind of changing our whole perspective on zone dampers or whatnot. Um, historically, 
no. And I wouldn't do it on a conventional system. Not a chance. Yeah. Nope. Yeah. That's my experience. The first time I ever had somebody say, well, we have a zone system. I was uh, a project managing uh, a remodel when I worked for my father and I was like 22 maybe. And I actually turned to the homeowner and said, I don't, I don't know what that means. And he said, well, we actually have this system so that we can do it and we can set temperatures and we can, we can adjust the dampers. And I said, okay, uh, is it supposed to be that hot up here? <laughs> like, <laughs> I literally thought that they were trying to keep the upstairs about six or seven degrees warmer than the layer below when so he you, said, oh, well, we so have a zone system. So you've always been a smart A, apparently, Dave. <laughs> this, isn't, this isn't something new in your life. You've always been this way. And I, and I was just like, okay, well, this, uh, yeah, this makes sense. I mean, we, I don't think we should do this. And that was I'll, I'll answer then. this one non-verbally. What do I think about zone dampers? <laughs> That's what I think about them. I've had that many great experiences with them. I will never do one again. Why would you? And, and, and let me transition from that to say the general public, when we talk about mini splits or Mitsubishi mini splits, they think that we're talking about some head on the wall back here. Now, certainly that can be an option. And often those are referred to as one-on-one -on -one systems. Like I've got my garage and I have this head in the wall and I have a unit outside and they connect one-to-one. -one. But there's so much more than that. And one of the questions we're getting from here, I can tell that Aaron Meyer, Meyer is kind of wondering about this as well. The beauty of Mitsubishi systems, if I can sum it up in kind of three or four minutes, and there are other people that have this technology too, but this is variable speed technology at the Freon line, at the outdoor unit, such that the outdoor unit that's maybe a three, four, five ton unit can ramp up its ability to deliver cold or hot air uh, or cold or hot freon maybe so that it can run at a half ton a ton a ton and a half two tons anywhere in between just about from about 10 percent of capacity up to 100 percent of capacity so that i can have multiple systems on the inside actually running off of that i might have two or three like in my house uh, i have two compressors outside and i have four indoor zones four indoor units one of the units is a mini split head. One of the units in my kitchen is a ceiling uh, unit that's recessed into the ceiling and it's kind of like a mini split head, but it's in the ceiling. One of them is a low static pressure system that we always jokingly refer to as pizza box systems because they look like about as big as five or six pizza boxes stacked up. And then there's a pair of pants plenum coming off. We use those all the time for master bedroom, master closets. And that's what I'm doing at my house. I just have one small unit. It's blowing air in just the two rooms, and now I can have a thermostat just for my master. They also make traditional upflow boxes, you know, those 1200 CFM big old gray boxes that blow the heck out and have totally normal uh, ceiling registers in the house. And so you could have, like I do all the time, totally conventional looking equipment to my clients. They have no idea I have Mitsubishi equipment in their house because all their return airs, all their grills on the ceiling look totally normal. But in fact, I've got a really high performance Mitsubishi box that's also high flow, which means I can use any type of filtration I want because it's a high static pressure one. And Eric designs for me sometimes these really fancy HEPA ones. Other times we just do more standard MERV 13, which is kind of what I use as my, my standard mm -hmm. system. Uh, and April Air makes those. They're great units. They're super efficient. They're also pretty darn affordable. They're like 200 bucks or something. They're not expensive at all. I can use that with my Mitsubishi uh, heat pump, which has high static pressure. And then I can build a house that might have multiple different systems in it. One small unit for the master, one big unit for the main space in the kids' bedrooms, one mini split head in the home office, or maybe the garage or some other space. And all that could be tied to one or two outdoor units. Uh, so it's really cool. If you're not familiar with their systems, they make all kinds of equipment. And when we say mini split, usually people are thinking head on the wall. But in fact, there's a whole host of things that utilize that same really efficient technology with variable speeds for both the fan and for the Freon and the outdoor unit. Uh, hopefully, I did your system justice uh, with my three-minute rant. Any last comments uh, from you guys before we uh, call it good? We had some great questions. I'm sorry I couldn't get to all those guys. Eric, you need to wrap up 
anything that I missed that you want to wrap up with? Okay, we lost Eric. Jake, you have anything that uh, you want to wrap up with? I think the takeaway is uh, build a really good house and then be very wise with your mechanical. So one uh, really simple question. Right, absolutely. Air, air tightness, seal up your building, seal up your ducts. Oh, I love it. That's right. Oh, and someone else did ask about duct blaster tests. We're big believers in both blow order tests and duct blaster tests. If you're doing standard duct work, you should get a, a duct test because if you test it during the phase that you can see all those ducts, if you have a problem or you made a mistake, you can fix it. Once the drywall's up, it's really, really hard later to figure out how do I increase my airflow to this room if, number one, there's an obstruction in the ducts, number two, there's a big part that's unsealed, let's say, and we made a mistake, or number three, we just undersized something and, oh, we blew it. It was a six-inch duct when it called for a 10-inch duct. So now if you duct blast it early and figure out your flows during pre-drawal, tons of money saved later, tons of hassle saved later. And Jake and I would tell you, you should, you should blow it or test every house pre-drywall and at the end of construction, because ultimately that's a great measure of performance for houses. And no matter what HVAC system you have, if you have a really uncomfortable leaky house, it's not going to do a great job of delivering comfort and healthy indoor air for your clients. Guys, uh, we're already one minute after. Thank you so much for your time, gentlemen. I really appreciate it. Eric, keep rocking on those plans, dude. You're absolutely you killing it. it for me. <laughs> if you don't know Positive Energy, look them up. They do work across the country. They're expensive and they're worth it. Uh, <laughs> Jake, check out his videos on Build Show Network. He's a killer builder that I'm always learning from him. Really, really smart. Second generation builder. He's been doing it almost as long as me, 20 plus years. Great, great builder. And Chad, uh, his contact info. Um, oh, by the way, you're going to get an ebook if you registered for this webinar yep. um, with a lot of these concepts that will help you form some of this in your mind if you're early on to high performance HVAC. Chad, thank you for all your support uh, sure. from you and thank the rest you, of the Matt. team at Mitsubishi Train. Uh, I've used a lot of your equipment over the years. You guys have great people and great equipment, and it's been a big part of my success as a builder. Uh, delivering comfort Absolutely. to my clients. So awesome. guys, thank you thanks, so much Matt. for joining everybody. Sorry all I right. couldn't get to all the questions. This is going to be recorded if you want to share this with your friends or your clients or another builder. So when you see that uh, on a follow-up email, check that link. It'll be on buildshownetwork.com. Guys, follow me on Twitter or Instagram. Otherwise, we'll see you then. Oh, wait a minute. That's for video. Sorry. See you <laughs> next time. All right, on so you got the to build show. Yes, I have to do it anyways. <laughs> Jake's laughing at me. Bye, guys. See you. All right, bye, everybody. See you, buddy.